Nagy szeretettel köszöntök minden résztvevőt, nézőt a Pestex Fesztiválon. Pillanatokon belül vendégünk lesz Zabine Hossenfelder, elméleti fizikus, akivel az angolul 2018-ban megjelent, és idén a parkiadó gondozásában már magyarul is olvasható, fizikusok útvesztőben, hogyan csábít tévutakra a matematikai szépség címmel megjelent könyvéről fogunk beszélgetni. Uh, Welcome to Pashtak Festival, uh, Professor Hosenfada. Uh, first, I would like to introduce you briefly to our audience. Um, so, Zabina Hosenfada is a research fellow at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies, where she conducts research in quantum gravity. Before that, she was a postdoc research fellow overseas at UCSB, that is the University of California, Santa Barbara, at the University of Arizona, Tucson, and at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo, Canada. Uh, beside that, she, uh, beside that so bef- beside being a serious scientist, she is a popular science writer who gives talks on physics and frequently writes blog posts about interesting problems in physics and mathematics. While she also explains uh, these problems on her YouTube channel that also contains her music videos. Uh, and her book entitled Lost in Mouth How Beauty Leads Physics Astray was published by Basic Books in 2018. And that's the first thing I would like to talk about, I mean your book. Uh, Many readers may expect uh, a kind of historical account, a history of physics and and how how physics went wrong when you you write a book about what's the problem in modern day physics. It might be because of an insistence on, on the idea of genealogy, meaning that to understand the problem, to explain the problem, you have to kind of sort out the history of the problem. Uh, and even though you have an historical account in your book, you, you list influential physicists, you list influential philosophers, but fundamentally what you do in your book is kind of give an account of, uh, of the contemporary scene. And, uh, and the main f- your main focus is the idea of beauty which uh, I would translate as, uh, um, as kind of given a mathematically compelling, but either untestable or, or, or kind of experimentally useless explanation for a phenomenon. So I don't know if, if this translation of, of beauty is kind of, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of rough translation. And those who, who refer to beauty Seem, seem to suppose an immediacy between mathematics and natural phenomena. Or better put, they suggest that there are laws in nature which are logical, and these laws can, can be mathematically formulated without any discrepancy, without any remains or, or, or something like that. Uh, so beauty neatly falls in line with another assumption, which you repeatedly criticize in your book, and that is the idea of naturalness. Uh, I don't know if I if I sum this up correctly. What your what the main focus of your book is? Um, well, so you started with um, saying that one may expect uh, a historical account of the topic, uh, which I did not do. I didn't do this because, well, for one, I felt I'm not the right person. I'm not a historian of science. I'm a, I'm a physicist, uh, and I didn't want to impersonate someone who I'm not. Uh, also, I thought it had been done before, pretty much. Like I, I uh, refer to several people who have written other books um, about uh, truth and beauty in um, in mathematics and in, in physics. Uh, so I didn't want to do it again. It, it seemed superfluous. Um, but of course, the history is relevant. So I have a chapter where I um, go through. Um, what has happened in the foundations of physics before, um, how people have used um, these arguments from beauty before, um, and the cases when it has worked and when it has not worked, uh, because I think that's important to understand where where people are coming from when they uh, use it today. So um, what, what do I actually mean uh, when I refer to beauty? So a, a beautiful theory is not necessarily one that is untestable. Um, It just so happens that most of the supposedly beautiful ideas turn out to be untestable. (laughs) Um, uh, But um, there there are just various mathematical criteria that theoretical physicists use 
uh, in the foundations of physics um, to construct theories um, which they consider beautiful. Um, you already mentioned naturalness. Um, that's just a mathematical criterion, which I can explain in further detail. Um, they also like symmetries. Uh, symmetries are uh, considered uh, beautiful and they generally like theories that have very few assumptions so it's a certain um, minimalicity um, I in the book I call it simplicity but I've I've realized that a lot of people find this confusing uh, because they confuse it with uh, Occam's razor um, and so so Occam's razor is a um, scientifically entirely fine criterion to use. So this is this is not what I mean by simplicity. Mm -hmm. I mean I mean a much stronger requirement than that. And uh, what you write about how the world insistence on naturalness hinders physics. So it kind of makes an obstacle for for physics to to progress. Uh, it reminds me of a passage from the Critique of Judgment by Immanuel Kant, in which Kant writes that uh, when I hear a bird sing. It, it is beautiful, but when I kind of look behind the bush and I see that it is in fact a man mimicking the bird's sounds, it is no longer beautiful. So uh, what, what you call uh, the, um, so those, those physicists that you write that are so fixated on naturalness, are they like the man in the bush mimicking the bird's sound? Or there is another literary example I can bring up. Um, there is a poem by, by Wordsworth uh, uh, it is entitled, There Was a Boy. And in the poem, there is a boy who, who tries to communicate with the owls, and, and sh he starts hooting. And when his hooting echoes, he takes it as a response by the owls, but it is in fact his own hooting echoing back to him. So uh, would, you, would you say that, that uh, these naturalists in physics are, are the man ducking in the bushes, mimicking bird sounds, or are they more like Wordsworth's boy who, who takes it, his own echoing hooting as a response from, from nature? Or, or is thought sort of different? Well, uh, that's, that's an interesting analogy. I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it uh, this way before. So um, I, I guess the difference is that uh, the, the man in the bush, you know, if you can mistake him for a bird, he must have been good at what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the problem with the physicists is that they are not actually good at what they're doing. They definitely think that they are, they are imitating nature, you know, with their mathematics. But if you look at, uh, uh, you know, what comes out in the end, they are not very successful with it. So they come up with all these uh, theories that they call natural, um, which, you know, you can think of as imitating certain uh, bird songs, um, but uh, then you don't find any bird <laughs> that actually belongs to that particular song. Wow. And this, this has happened over and over again. And we, we've seen the most recent round with um, the results from the Large Hadron Collider, right? I mean, they, they, um, they did find the Higgs boson. Uh, but this is a very old prediction, dates back to the 1960s. Um, but the, the Large Hadron Collider was supposed to find uh, many more particles. And that was because uh, they invented a theory based uh, on this idea of naturalness. And it didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, unfor unfortunately. And that, that's, what I, um, that's what I want to, want to, I would just further elaborate on the idea of naturalness. Um, uh, it is also, to me, it also brought uh, to my mind what Gestalt psychology calls bond form, like good forms. And uh, you, you hint at that when you, when you write about Kepler's discovery that uh, the planets, in fact, revolve on, a, on an ellipse and not, not on a circle. So that's one of the parts of your historical, one of the historical parts in your book. And uh, there's also, uh, I quote you, it is a really good example. Uh, quote, it's like someone told us the outcome of throwing a dice once, but this doesn't tell us anything about the shape of the die. Uh, the uniform distribution, like the regular die, might seem pretty. But that's exactly the kind of human choice that naturalness attempts to get rid of." Unquote. So uh, we would immediately suppose that the dice that we throw is like a standard dice with six sides, because that is what is beautiful, that aka intuitive, aka natural. Um, and you say that our choice, 
our cognition shouldn't matter in these in these um, in these cases in in physics, and uh, it was it was so compelling to reach a book because I would have thought that of course in the humanities uh, the discipline even contains human in its name. So we even though we have posthumanism and, and new trends like that. We can't easily get rid of the human. And I would have thought that in, in the field of STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, it is like so much easier to, to get rid of these cognitive fallacies and, and stuff like intu intuition. And, and basically, you said, no, it, it lives with us. It is an insistence of, of always kind of calculating the human into something that, that says we are objective, we are experimental, and we are we are working with with stuff like quarks that are like so tiny so microscopic that we can't even imagine it so so how how come it, you physics are having such a hard time getting rid of uh human human intuition and, and cognitive fallacies yeah, well you know it's hard to get rid of uh, humans if humans <laughs> are those who do the science um but uh, part of the problem is a, a lack of uh, self-reflection. Um, so the, the reason the book is called Lost in, in Math is that they don't actually know what they're doing. <laughs> um, so they are using these mathematical criteria, uh, for example, the one with naturalness, where you just uh, had this quote with the dice. Um, but they don't realize that this is what they're doing. Um, maybe I can illustrate what this example was referring to a little more specifically. So if um, we throw a dice, or we, we uh, calculate the probabilities for the outcomes based on uh, you know, us knowing that uh, it, it has a very regular shape, we can collect statistics for the outcome you know you throw the dice a million times and you figure out uh well it you know each phase has the same probability of coming up so you have some statistics uh, and based on that you can make predictions for what you expect to come next now um the problem is that in the foundations of physics um how how scientists are trying to use these statistics is um not for repeated measurements of something but it's for the constants of nature mm -hmm. uh, in these theories that we use um, there are certain constants uh, that we just measure like say the the strength of the electroweak uh, interaction or the the cosmological constant uh, the mass of the electron stuff like that um, and um, now they have certain expectations for what those masses should be mm -hmm. And uh, they base them implicitly, but not explicitly. That's the problem on this idea that these uh, numbers basically should have a certain distribution. That's just um, an, uh, an even unit uh, distribution. So it, do it doesn't matter which number you pick, they should all have the same probability. And I'm saying, well, that's an assumption that you made, which is not based on any empirical knowledge, because we only have this one value of the constant, <laughs> right? That, that's in our universe. Um, and so we can't say anything about this probability distribution. There isn't any probability distribution. It makes no sense to even talk about it. But the assumption that this probability distribution exists somehow and has this particular shape underlies all these arguments about um, how s certain constants are supposedly unnatural. And I'm just saying this is uh, mathematically not well defined. Exactly. We'll get, get back to, to, to your idea and, and one of your main theses in the book is, is kind of like physics would feel itself so much better if physicists stated their assumptions and not like discrediting them as something like, like I'm not biased and, and leave, me, leave me alone with these social, so, social ar or sociological arguments of yours. We'll, we'll get back to that in a second because it is really important and really interesting uh, aspect in your book. Uh, what seemed seemingly ambivalent first about uh, about your book when I started reading it is that you heavily criticize your colleagues' pseudo arguments for a theory that either starts or ends or both with a reference to physical intuition. You, you uh, sought out a few examples like saying that I can feel it in my gut or that this this formula is just or this 
I don't know, this equation or this mathematical figure is just so pretty not to be true. Um, and she also delivers some blows to what in the humanities is called aesthetic differentiation. It is something that something has its aesthetic volume in itself and uh, it is kind of a quarantined aesthetic. Uh, yet subjectivity plays a characteristic role in your book because, uh, and in your book's narrative because you often return to your motivation for becoming a scientist and you always say that I want to make sense of the world. It is a quest for, for making sense. It is your personal quest for meaning. And she also interview highly decorated scientists, your colleagues, with whom you're usually on, on a first name basis with. And uh, you also incorporated in your book's narrative your, your own experience, like moving from one place to another because of research grants, answering emails by your colleagues, by your, uh, from, your, from your PhD students. Uh, so you kind of give an overall coverage of what business as usual means in academic life. And um, I want to ask you, what was, your, what was the whole idea behind constructing this narrative? And, and how did you choose the people you interviewed? Uh, and wha why did you choose them exactly? Maybe uh, wh what, I, what I kind of figured is... Uh, for instance, when you when you were at the University of Arizona, you interviewed someone from the University of Arizona. When you moved back to Germany, then you went to George Ellis in Wuppertal, or near Wuppertal. So it, geography or, or location must have played a, a role in that. But, but so what was this idea behind constructing this this very subjective narrative that makes the book absolutely fun to read? Uh, of course. Well, so the book is kind of telling my own story. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to make sense of, I'm trying to find out what do they think they are doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I go and ask them questions and um, I, I wasn't sure what I would find, you know, when I started writing this book. Uh, it was... You know, I'd, I'd never interviewed someone before. It was a new Whoa, thing for me. I, mean, I had to struggle with the stupid <laughs> recorder. I didn't have told know how that? to use it. Have told that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's the first for everything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, let me come back to the subjectivity that you raised. Uh, I mean, as I already said, you know, um, we, we're all humans and we have our own perspective on things. We have our own motivations. Uh, and for some people, the motivation is to look for beauty um, and you know I, I don't blame them for that uh, as I say I, I want them to put the cards on the table you know if um, they um, if they see that their task as a researcher in constructing beautiful theories whether or not they are correct then uh, please they should say so um, because then probably no one had hired them uh, on a job <laughs> as a scientist you know, maybe there's a place for that. Uh, I mean, you know, a, a lot of mathematics, uh, I would say, you know, from my perspective, it's kind of an art, you know, an, an mm -hmm. art or maybe kind of a, a sport. Uh, <laughs> and it, it has a reason for existence in its own right, you know, not necessarily because math is also useful. Yes, it happens to be useful, but not all of math is useful. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, the problem I, I have is that um, you have you have all these many very well paid people uh, who pretend they're doing science, but they're actually not doing science. Uh, th that that that's my problem. And so, uh, well, how, do, how did I pick people? It had very little to do with um, location, actually. I didn't know. <laughs> I had no idea that uh, John Ellis would be in the Wuppertal, where, so he has family there. I didn't know this. I was thinking he would be in Cape Town. Uh -huh. uh, but he wasn't so lucky for me, you know, <laughs> I thought, well, if he's in Germany, that will make my life easier, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the first um, time you visited him, uh, he wasn't there. So you had to go again, like two weeks later. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was a miscommunication. <laughs> so, so what happened was that um, I asked him, like, uh, can we meet at some point? And he was like, uh, we are, well, I'll, I'll be visiting Wuppertal. Uh, we can meet there. And uh, he said, 
on Friday. So I, I thought, well, it would be the coming Friday, right? <laughs> so I went there on that Friday, but actually it turned out he meant the Friday two weeks later. <laughs> and how, how was I supposed to know that, right? Well, maybe it's a Cape Town thing. Like when they say Friday, it means like two weeks later Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, in any case, so in hindsight, it's funny, but it was terribly annoying because it's like a, it's a four hour drive. And yeah, so from so Frankfurt. Drop there, rang on the door <laughs> and, and his daughter said, well, he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I just drove back and, and that was that. Um, yeah, and I mean, the other people, I've mostly picked people who I um, who I thought would have something to say uh, about the topic. Like, I mean, there were kind of obvious choices. Uh, there's uh, Stephen Weinberg, yeah, of course. Who, who has said a lot about um, this, the mathematical structure of the fundamental laws of nature. Um, and um, Frank Wilczek wrote a book about the, the topic himself. Um, there's uh, John Fran Francesco uh, uh, Giudice, uh, who has also said uh, something specifically about naturalness. So that's what he's kind of uh, famous for, um, and, and so on. Um, you know, I, uh, Ch Chad Orzel, uh, so uh, I, I know him personally, and <laughs> he's kind of there. Uh, to provide a little bit of contrast, <laughs> you know, as, as someone who actually does um, experiments in the, in the laboratory. Um, so for me, he's kind of the same person. <laughs> <laughs> um, your, your take on intuition and science reminded me a lot of, I don't know if you, if you know his or if you're familiar with his work, but it's kind of a, like a big hit in the humanities. Bruno Latour, who, who was a scientist and started, started to, you know, to move to, to humanities and write about science, but not popular science, but kind of like the sociology or anthropology of science, but, but he knows what he's talking about. So his, his first book that was a big hit was called Laboratory Life. And what he basically did is he went into, I, didn't, I think it was, it was biologists, not physicists, uh, so he went into a laboratory and they kind of conducted uh, an observation for like weeks and, and uh, they went into how, how ideas come around and it even included like, okay, there is a post-it on the coffee machine that kind of, you know, just switches a light bulb in, in, in the mind of someone or, or you know, like, like throwing away uh, scribbles and, and small notes and, and someone else finding them and then, then he gets an idea. It's, uh, it's uh, really interesting and, and what, you, what you write about uh, in your book like you, you concentrate on like all aspects, how science is made and how it is produced. And what I found really fascinating that uh, the you, you even tackle the idea or the phenomena of depression due to failure to prove that a theory is correct after years of anticipation. One of your one of your uh, one of your uh, colleagues that you conduct an interview with is uh, Joseph Porchinsky, and I quote him because that that is a, kind of a really interesting part in the book. Uh, quote: I wanted this to go away, but it didn't go away. Joe says, even after people started working on this and started to study this, I wanted it to go away. And this "it" in in his sentence is that the cosmological constant is a random parameter parameter and uh, and thus we can only calculate the most probable value of it we can still observe uh, so I continue quoting him I literally had to go to the psychiatrist over this it made me so unhappy I felt like it was taking away one of our last great clues as to the basic nature of fundamental physics because things we had hoped to calculate now became random unquote so you you tackle a lot uh, with this this subject and it was like really enlightening to me and I didn't know if it's um it's kind of a point that that uh, you might not like I mean uh, in interviews I guess many people bring up uh, the series the Big Bang Theory uh, with Sheldon Cooper the theoretical scientist and uh, when I read these passages in your book, uh, it imme I immediately understood that how correct the portrayal of, uh, of an experimental physicist finding out his theory is, is untestable or finding out that his theory is not correct and like going, going into a downward sp a spiral. And in the series, of course, it was funny. We laughed at it, but it, it was really shocking to, to you know, to 
to realize that these things do happen in real life and that's how physicists actually actually uh, you know react to that and um, uh, I, I really like that you 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 tackle these issues that your colleagues say that this is social or sociological and one of the main ideas of Bu Bruno Latour that I brought up is that we think all our problems in science uh, originate from thinking to know the social too well and uh, based on your book I would say that you, you kind of so the social aspect is kind of integrated into making science am I correct so you kind of regard physics uh, uh, that is not quarantined from from real life but but the social is kind of almost an essential part of it so can you can you elaborate on that a bit if you if you would like to yes maybe let me give you first some context on th that quote which you just read uh, from john polchinski um, who has meanwhile died by the way um, oh uh, i'm so uh, yes, sorry to hear um, that very sadly um yeah um so he he wanted me to put this in the book um you know he explicitly asked me that that i put it there because he wanted um young people to know uh, that uh, it, it's a problem and it happens uh, and um, one has to you know go to a doctor and try to do something about it um, so so this is why I why I put it in the book I, I thought it, I thought he was right it, uh, it, it should be mentioned um, so th this is certainly a problem um, he was not referring to a theory that turned out to be wrong though in, instead he was referring to a theory that turned out not to be to his liking basically uh -huh. so he did the calculation and he found something which he didn't like and that made him literally depressed uh, and and i can understand this you know you you spend your whole life on this uh, it's how you i mean for for him you know he's he was convinced that this is how the universe works. Mm -hmm. okay, so I'm not quite as convinced that that's how the universe works, but uh, that, that's the situation. And um, he, he, he thought it was ugly, right? So, mm -hmm. so you have to live with uh, knowing that the universe is just this, this random other thing and nothing really makes any sense. And that, that's, a, that's tough <laughs> to cope with. And, and there are other things in the foundations of physics that I think people shy away from because they're just mentally hard to cope with. Mm -hmm. For example, in, in the foundations of physics, and this, this doesn't come up in the book because it would have been a very long uh, elaboration, uh, is um, this issue of free will in quantum mechanics. Um, which a lot of people kind of, you know, uh, try to get rid of. Um, and I think that's, that they're trying to avoid even thinking about it. Um, but yeah, so to come back to the broader question of um, the so sociology of science, um, I think that the sociology of the scientific community um, is a very important aspect of how we proceed in understanding uh, our own research. We need this feedback uh, from other people. I mean, this is most obvious in peer review, but it happens long before that. Um, you, you learn from other people, yep. um, you hear what they work on, you get feedback on um, what you work on. And uh, so it, it may seem like if you write a paper, a single author or something like this was only your own work, but that's never correct. It builds on so many other people's work. And I think that, that too many physicists in particular completely ignore this connection that they rely on with, with so many other people, how important it is to have the support network. Uh, and so I think they overestimate their independence and uh, this creates a problem because uh, they they are not aware how much their opinion about what's the right thing to do is influenced by what other people believe. Yeah, and uh, after finishing your book, I, I was left with two radical impressions. The first is that we in the humanities like to think about ourselves as, you know, uh, uh, as members of the Republic of Letters. 
uh, the Respublica Literaria, but you also have that. You're, you're also kind of a, a family or, or a republic of, of, of scientists in, in the field of physics. The other one is less flattering because it was kind of like, um, I don't know, it might be rude to say that, but it kind of left, your book kind of left me with the impression that, that Contemporary physics has the worst case of OCD ever. Like, wha wha you, you, you take away the physicist's blanket of protection and boom, they, they become like really, really desperate. But now to, to marry your topics, you mentioned quantum, uh, quantum mechanics, which is an interesting case uh, with regard to, to the idea of naturalness. And... Um, there, there is a story uh, about um, a graduate, a graduate student of uh, of a colleague ba of Weinberg, who wanted to understand quantum mechanics, and then their whole career just disintegrated. And uh, well, I don't know if I can recapitulate, recapitulate it right, but it's kind of like. Uh, Quantum physics is an odd case because there are no phenomenologists. You are a phenomenologist, uh, but the in qu and you work in quantum gravity. And to our, our viewers, uh, a phenomenologist in physics is not the same as um, as uh, in our field. So, so uh, phenomenologists are kind of the middleman between the theoretical physicist and the experimentalist, and they kind of simplify the math and and they kind of uh, describe. Uh, the relationship, the empirical relationship between two phenomena, but they don't have to explain the why, so the why of the the cause of the of the relationship. So uh, on the one hand, on the one hand, there are no phenomenologists uh, in quantum mechanics. On the other hand, uh, uh, that's what Weinberg says, and that's what that's what you say. Uh, quantum theory uh, kind of calculates with a human observer. So even though even though there are no phenomenologists, they still kind of include the human in that. So uh, is it correct, my recapitulation of why, why quantum physics is kind of the odd one out? Yes, that's the big problem with quantum mechanics. Mechanics, is, sorry. Yeah. Is that um, <coughs> you, you, you have to say something about how measurements happen. And uh, this brings up the question, how do you make a measurement? Who makes the measurement? Uh, does any of that matter? Uh, and it's not in the mathematics. So you, d you actually don't really know. It's like in the laboratory, <laughs> if, if you have someone who actually makes a measurement, okay, so you, you can calculate what the outcome is. But fundamentally, we don't understand what it is. It's not in the theory. It's kind of an external assumption that... Uh, brings in this macro macroscopic uh, realm and uh, Weinberg is is very unhappy about it it's actually funny since you if you pick out this point about uh, phenomenology um, y yes as you said correctly the phenomenologists are kind of the people who connect the the big uh, math heavy theory uh, with the experiments uh, and in the foundations of quantum mechanics, the peculiar thing is that you have a lot of people who are talking about interpretations and, yeah, you know, they have all the theories. And then on the other hand, yeah, you have people who build quantum computers, basically. <laughs> so there's this big gap in the middle. And uh, after I finished the paper, uh, Weinberg published a paper which which falls right into this middle part, Where? you know. <laughs> so so the, the, there are here and there, there are a few people who do work uh, on this. Um, for, for example, there are some people who work with models of um, spontaneous collapse. That's basically a way of uh, inventing a physical process for the act of measurement, uh, roughly speaking. Um, so, um, you know, there are some ideas that, that fall into this middle uh, regime, but, but the field doesn't really exist. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so I think that's uh, what's missing. It's also one of the things that I myself work on, or I would be working on uh, <laughs> if I wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, just now and also in your book that uh, 
you're working with things that you, you don't fundamentally understand and uh, the graduate student that you mentioned in your book and I mentioned in, in our discussion is it kind of points towards that you, it is also really dangerous to get into the fundamentals of quantum mechanics or string theory and stuff like that. And you are a, a, um, a popular science writer of a, of a popular blog. Uh, and, and I was wondering how you communicate your findings, your results to wider public when you are discouraged to, to go into the fundamentals of your field. So, so how, how is that? Because it, it, you know, in in the humanities, y you're always told that the the thing that you understand fully, that's what you can you can you can communicate on a level that is accessible to a wider public, and and it, in in your field, it's like totally different. <laughs> or it well, looks like um, that. That's a very interesting question. So so first, let me maybe clarify um, that. So what. Uh, the, the case of the student who uh, dropped out of physics because he tried to understand the foundations of quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> that must be a somewhat older story. It's actually gotten much better now um, because there has been a lot of technological progress in quantum information, quantum computing, quantum cryptography, all that stuff. You know, the quantum internet is coming. You, mm -hmm. you read about this every other day. Um, and this has revived this interest in the foundations of quantum mechanics to some extent. Uh, you know, it's it's actually much better now than it was when I was a student. It's it doesn't uh, <laughs> smell so fishy anymore. <laughs> but it's it's still you know practically difficult to find any job to actually work on it. So so that's still there. Um, now the the question about my writing. These two things are not uh, unrelated. You know mm -hmm. because. Uh, I, I full well know that the stuff that I'm interested in, that I do my own research in, is basically the stuff I'm not supposed to be working on because there's nobody who will pay for it. So, uh -huh. so that's a practical problem. So I, I live under this constant th threat that I will not have an income next year. I don't have a permanent position. I sit on short-term grants. Um, and so uh, I do the writing and I, I write my blog, I do YouTube and so on a little bit as a safety backup. Right? Oh, I see. <laughs> so if, if one day I will not manage to get another research grant, which I'm like constantly prepared for, um, then, uh, you know, I can still feed the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that's the thinking there. Um, but yeah, what I most what I mostly do, since you ask, like, how do you communicate something that you don't know? <laughs> I'm I'm mostly trying to explain um, how much do we know and where uh -huh. does our knowledge end? Like, uh -huh. what are the what are the open problems um, and what are people trying to do about it? Um, so, so that's basically what I uh, what I focus on. Yeah, and uh, also I'm just saying it to the to your viewers that. Um, uh, in your book, you, you go pretty deep in what's wrong structurally or institutionally with physics. And there is a really interesting part about uh, why string theory is so popular, not, uh, not also am in among the public, but also among physicists. And I, I, won't, uh, I won't spoiler it, but it is so, it is so enlightening. Um, you, and if we are um, if we are at the topic of, of problems with with doing research and, and doing research you're not supposed to because you not get funding for that um, you are if I understood it correctly so you're the, the head or you're the leader of uh, the analog systems for gravity jewels research group in Frankfurt so is it a research group it is I think so uh, and as as the leader or as the head of this research research group, what what practices do you exercise that kind of makes uh, the toxic academic environment a little bit better? How how do you how do you communicate differently with your with your students or PhD students or, or those people who turn to you for advice or for revision differently than you were communicated to when you were a graduate student, for example? So uh, how, how, how do you put your criticism into use when you're in the field? <laughs> 
what, what, what do you do for the culture <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to get so, better? So about the, the research project on analog gravity, which you just named, I'm, I'm guessing you took this from uh, Wikipedia. Yeah, I did. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so it's, a little, <laughs> it's a little out of date because this project ran, ran out uh, end of last year. Oh, I so, see. So uh, I'm now working on a different project, uh, which is uh, dark matter. Uh -huh. um, so it's kind of it's super fluid dark matter and analog gravity also used super fluid so that the two are not entirely uncorrelated but it's uh, it's a somewhat different uh, topic the um, the, the group uh, that is mentioned there is basically uh, me and the student <laughs> so it's not much of oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and unfortunately, I have to say that the student didn't get funding. So that's, um, you know, at least not from this research grant. I applied for his funding, but it didn't go through. Uh, so now I had to scrape together a at least a tiny little bit of funding for him um, from other sources. And it's it's terribly annoying. Like, it's it's not like we're talking about billions here. <laughs> you know, we're, we're talking about something like 10,000 euro that I can't get to 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 pay a student for three years. It's It's ridiculous, you know. Um, in any case, so I mean, and if you're asking concretely, what am I trying to do different yeah. than uh, when I was a PhD student, I guess the, the simplest uh, thing to say is that I'm trying to actually talk to him, <laughs> which <laughs> my uh, which my supervisor did not do. Uh, uh, you know, at least technically, the person who was my supervisor, you know, was some professor who I spoke with maybe twice. Um, oh. Was it uh, Professor Famous from your from your single The Ivory Tower at the end of the corridor with uh, uh, sitting no, office? It, it <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it did it did not refer to anybody. In oh, particular. I see. Okay. Uh, it was just a general, <laughs> 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 you know, extraction from you know each institute has its famous professors <laughs> who uh, were constantly working and. Uh, <laughs> Um, yes, but I, I, I mean, I, I certainly try to, you know, listen to my own advice um, mm -hmm. and try, for example, it's very common in my field to judge um, people by how many papers they have published, uh, how often have these papers been cited. And uh, I'm trying to be very careful about these numbers, uh, you know, very consciously careful just because a paper has not been cited does not mean there's something wrong with the paper it, it may just be that it's the topic is so obscure for most people that no one ever looked at it <laughs> it may just be the case you know if, just because it's not popular enough is is uh, a good reason for why nobody looked at the paper um so so the this would would be an example um okay Thank you. So uh, my final question, which might be the penultimate question in, in you know, the afterworks of this, of this reel, is that uh, uh, your interview with George Ellis was especially dear to my heart because he, he was like, uh, he was kind of scored in these, these big names in, in physics uh, that they didn't even read, read like elementary philosophy like Hume or Kant and stuff like that. And she both agree on... Uh, that physicists are sloppy philosophers, uh, even though uh, Heisenberg or, or Schrodinger are regarded in the humanities as philosophers too. And, and uh, I had a PhD seminar where we actually read essays by Heisenberg and Schrodinger, and they actually made sense in our field, maybe not in yours. But <laughs> and my question is, it's a kind of, kind of um, assemblage of, of questions that, um, why do you think that scientists like uh, Stephen Hawking is mentioned in your book, but there is also Richard Dawkins, who are you know established science scientists in their field, kind of you know after become like big hits, they kind of move on to you know scrutinize philosophical stuff and and publish. Uh, essays uh, uh, which we would regard as philosophy. Do, so do you think that it is kind of, for, for scientists, is it kind of like the next step in their quest, quest uh, for meaning or making sense? Or, or do you think that, that sometimes, even though philosophy belongs with the humanities, but sometimes philosophy can show itself to be less of a slippery slope 
than than for instance quantum mechanics or or you know or sometimes when you when you make a proposition in the philosophical sense in philosophy sometimes it is more solid than you know uh than like dark matter particles that are liquid allegedly so so why do you think that these established uh scientists somehow shift to to philosophy at a certain point in their lives and and also i would like to ask just a tiny question about alice like when do you think that it is kind of an old school physicist mentality that he has that he would make it like um mandatory for physicists to read like basic philosophy so that these are my two questions <laughs> first a clarification uh, the the reference to my book where I say that uh, physicists are sloppy philosophers uh, refers to physicists today oh i see uh, mm -hmm. exactly exactly because i think that's one of the things that got missing in in the last uh, century so uh, if you look at people like uh, schrodinger and also um Bohr, uh, for yep. example, they were very strong on the philosophy, and I, I think that the science, science benefited from that. But but we have lost that. You know, it came with this shut up and calculate uh, f philosophy uh, <laughs> that spread, and I think it was not good for physics. So we have this big uh, disconnect um, that certainly to some extent has just been driven by physics being spectacularly successful. Like there's, there's, you know, you can complain about quantum mechanics all you want. It certainly works very well, and it has led to a dramatic amount of technological progress. And so there, there is what, uh, what uh, Kuhn would have called uh, normal science. You know, you have this normal science phase where people just do calculations, and and that's what you do. But I kind of feel that we've we've come to to the end of that phase, right? Uh -huh. and, and so we're, we're hitting on these big questions. And uh, so you ask, um, why um, do so so many people seem to shift uh, to philosophy late in their career? Um, I, Stephen Hawking, by the way, was not one of them. Stephen, Stephen Hawking was highly um, critical of philosophy. Yeah. Um, he, he was the guy who said philosophy is dead, uh, basically trying to point out um, there's nothing we can do with it. Yeah, but when yeah. he, whenever he meditated on the existence of God, and you know, it, it just kind of goes, kind of re revives the, the, the yeah, that yeah, it's, philosophy. Yeah, kind of, he, he was doing philosophy without knowing that yeah. he was doing <laughs> philosophy. Uh, so, so the thing is that um, I, I think uh, in, in the foundations of physics, uh, a lot of people at some point notice that what they are doing is actually more philosophy than mm -hmm. it is science. Uh, and uh, some of them decide to just formally make that step. Um, uh, there are quite a few cases, actually, uh, where you have physicists uh, in, in, the, in their late years actually, you know, um, going into philosophy, sometimes making another PhD, writing books. Uh -huh. I just reviewed a book by um, a guy who, an astrophysicist, um, who is now uh, written a, a serious book on the philosophy of physics um, about dark matter. And it's a really good book. You know, that's, um, I, maybe I should add that I think to some extent it's also because a lot of us realize that, um, you know, your, your technically best years are sometime in your 30s, maybe up to the age of 40. So I'm already old. Uh, when more. it comes to <laughs> yeah uh, no I mean it's like it's like a it's like a, a, a athletics uh, uh, right uh -huh. uh, you you just age and at some point you get stuck on the same ideas uh, that's just how the brain works and then you can um, you know you you can go with that uh, for you know one two more decades which is what a lot of people do because you have you have built yourself um, a certain basis on which you can work uh, and then then you work out the details of these ideas uh, that you have but um, a lot of people at some point um, either go into administration mm -hmm. um, that's something they can do or they go into politics you know they become very active in science policy making yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh, that, that kind of uh, that kind of thing uh, you know i mean 
politics in the sense of actually communicating with government advisors. Like, How, right like a stuff. counselors or something like that, a uh, counsel to, to politicians. Yeah, yeah, or, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, this is something, or they do more science communication and, and others decide they go into philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that's kind of a trajectory that makes sense, right? You, you have to plan how you want to spend all these uh, decades, you know, you can't <laughs> do the same thing uh, forever. Um, so, and you asked a question uh, uh, about uh, Alice. Um, you know, I, I guess it would be hard to um, force all beginning physics students to actually take a serious uh, education in philosophy. It's just not workable. Uh, but I definitely think that some uh, basic education in philosophy um, is absolutely necessary. Like, I mean, we, we, we did this as a student and I know that there are quite some um, uh, universities who do it, uh, but I think it, it should be a more formal requirement. Uh, personally, what I think what is missing in this education is also some knowledge about the sociology of science, not mm -hmm. only the philosophy, but also the sociology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I mentioned that one of your, your thesis sentences in the book is kind of like state your assumptions, put all your cards on the table. Now, I don't want to finish this interview without mentioning another thesis sentence, I think it is, uh, and it goes like that, quote, objective argumentation becomes more relevant the more we, uh, the more we rely on logical reasoning detached from experimental guidance. And that's exactly, I think, what philosophy can do to physics, like learning the rhetorics, learning how to argue, because it is one, one, of, the, one of the things that I think that kind of keeps physics or leads physics into the dark that uh, based on your book is that reasoning is more and more detached from experimental guidance and you can't, can't you know, just do that anymore that yeah, the experience showed that I'm correct, that I'm right, but what you have to, and, and that's why so many of these biases and so many of these these intuitions are in circulation and, and what you say that the sociology of, of science can help you with, with unveiling these biases and, and intuitions. So, um, uh, Zabina, uh, thank you so much for, for being available to us. It was uh, a thrilling discussion. I, I immersely enjoyed your book and, and I, I, I'm, I feel so honored that I had the chance to, to conduct this interview with you. I hope you, you also had fun too. And, um, and uh, thank, you, thank you so much for, for being here with us at Pashtax Festival. Thanks for having me, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say uh, it's nice to be here, but actually I'm not there, right? Yeah, yeah I'm so, uh, sorry. It's, uh, yeah, it's the, it's the virus. But, but even, even virtually, it, it, was, it was such a thrill to, to have this conversation with, with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey. Ez volt a beszélgetés Zabina Hosszenfelder elméleti fizikussal, a tudomány szociológiájáról, arról, hogy a filozófusok és a fi fizikusok között uh, milyen különbségek és milyen hasonlóságok vannak, hogy mi az, ami, amit uh, természetességen értünk, szépségen értünk, és hogy miért tud ez nagyon veszélyes lenni a, a mai fizikára, és, uh, és egyáltalán, hogy hogyan, hogyan is néz ki intézményesen a, a mai fizikai szintér, és hogy mit remélhetünk a jövőben, illetve hogyan, hogyan lehetne valami fényesebb jövőt elhozni a, a fizika számára. Köszönöm szépen a figyelmet!